This is Human Capital, produced by Goalspan, and I'm Jeff Hunt. My goal on this podcast is to uncover the deeply human aspect of work. One of the ways we can develop organizations and leaders to be their best is by recognizing and addressing different types of bias that show up at work. Think about unconscious bias for a second. How does it show up in your workplace? Is it when the younger female is always asked to be the one to take notes at your meetings? Or perhaps all new hires seem to be the same age, gender, or ethnicity. Maybe you were called out for a recent problem in your performance review, but your manager forgot how you actually crushed it on that project like five months ago. Unconscious bias causes untold problems. And today my guest is going to help you see how it shows up at work and in yourself and what to do about it. He's gonna show us how everyone on planet Earth actually has bias. Matthew Cahill is an expert in unconscious bias. He understands cognitive, social, and institutional biases. And his company, Precipio, works with business leaders to identify hidden and sometimes not so hidden biases that impact company performance. Percipio ultimately helps organizations move from bias to belonging, which by the way, leads to better financial performance for all you finance and accounting professionals listening today. <laughs> Welcome, Matthew. Mm, thank you, Jeff. Appreciate being here. Thanks for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom today. This is a difficult topic and it's one that a lot of people don't understand. And so I'm excited to unpack it with you. But before we do, share briefly about your career journey and who inspired you most along the way. Mm. My own journey started in 2010 when a former boss of mine asked me if I would come and do some consulting work with this small burgeoning company at the time called LinkedIn. Most of your listeners would know LinkedIn now as it's uh, somewhat of a household name in within the American borders and beyond. That's what pulled me into this uh, 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 this type of work in terms of, of, of applying it from an external person, an external perspective to help an organization refine and root out biases that have become baked into their processes and their systems of governance. And, and in LinkedIn's case, it was just in their, their rapid growth trajectory. They had internalized some unconscious bias. And by changing some of the processes, we were then able to put some mitigation strategies in so that those biases weren't perpetuating the kind of you know, practices, in this case, hiring practices, that uh, we're leading the company in a, in a homogenous direction. So I'll give credit to my former boss as being the person that really uh, initiated me and you know pulled me down this road. I love that. Give our listeners, Matthew, a quick definition of bias, just to make sure that we're all sort of starting on the same page. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, that is the starting point for this conversation, that is the starting point that I use with my prospects, with my clients. It's, it's level setting on what we're talking about. I think one of the reasons that bias is such a useful linguistic construct is because it's, it's so malleable. It can be used and it means different things in different contexts. Uh, almost like you know the, the word snow has 16 different variations in native Alaskans, more indigenous tribe, people that live in the snow, right? They look at it differently. They, they embrace it differently. And I feel the same way about bias. Bias is something that it can be used in the context of, of gender bias, of racial bias, of bias related to culture, ethnicity, orientation, age, abilities, mental health. Like there's a lot of of social biases. Collectively, I call them social biases. And I think those that type of bias is best measured in behaviors, not necessarily thoughts, right? Best measured in actions, how people relate and interact with one another, which is intimately related to thought, 
But I think the realm of, of unconscious bias is relegated to thoughts. I think that's where bias originates. That's where it begins, is in our brains. And therefore, the tagline, if you have a brain, you have bias, it's not anything to fear. It's not anything to feel bad about. It's really coming into it with a measure of curiosity and, uh, and excitement, actually, to learn more about how your brain is processing information and where you're susceptible to errors in judgment. Very interesting. And I mentioned in, the, in my intro that virtually every human being on the planet has bias or unconscious bias which completely supports your concept of have a brain, have bias, which I believe, didn't you have that trademarked or? Something? I do, <laughs> I do. You can look it up that uh, in the patent office, the Percipio company owns the trademark rights to if you have a brain, you have bias because I believe so strongly in it. And, and what it also does simultaneously is start to destigmatize bias. What I meant when I said bias is a useful linguistic construct is because once you start to frame a conversation around that, it has very different implications because it's not uncommon to hear somebody say, I have a bias for ice cream instead of chocolate, or it can be used in a, in a positive construct, but it's also provocative, right? So that it catches your attention. And in a world where we are so, uh, our attention is, is probably the most sought after uh, commodity that we have, and we're not even aware of it, right? So you, we need to have uh, starting points that are able to capture our attention, which I think bias also serves that purpose. If, if you are able to destigmatize bias and really lean into the conversation with a measure of curiosity, it's a very different outcome than if you're leading a conversation with prejudice or harassment or discrimination. I mean, these terms are closely related to bias quite often, but when you lead with those terms, you're immediately creating a defensive reaction. There's, there's legal implications to conversations that are rooted in those terms. And I don't know that they necessarily lead towards a constructive outcome. And, uh, and, and if you're having that conversation, maybe you don't want a constructive outcome. Maybe you need to part ways with somebody, right? So I don't want to say those are useless terms, but they're very different and they're very different conversations. One method or approach leads to an openness and a, a dialogue that's constructive. And it sounds like the other one leads to one that is fueled with defensiveness and potential problems. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And everything in between. I mentioned some examples of unconscious bias in my intro. I'm curious about what ways you've seen unconscious bias show up with your clients and in your own life. What are some specific examples that you can think of? Well, what you used are great priming examples. I mean, those are examples that are, are not necessarily obvious, but you can see they're, they're very ubiquitous. Like you can see a lot of those examples. There's other research that's been done to, to provide evidence of unconscious bias uh, with you know, male names on resumes versus female names on resumes. And if you, the, the rest of the resume is identical, but you know, the male name gets favorable treatment, ends up getting offered more money, uh, you could do these, there's similar experiments that have been done with white sounding names versus black sounding names. Uh, there's, there's a lot of research that goes in to show the existence and evidence of uh, unconscious bias. One of my favorite activities is to, you know, teach, cons like, like make people aware of some of these unconscious biases, and then just have them step back and look at their own life, because you don't have to look very far to see the effect of unconscious bias. The easiest one is like me bias, right? That's one that we're all subject to because we all gravitate towards people who are like us. And, uh, and I'll have people often do a, you know, a, a trusted five activity where you, you have to name the, the five people in your life that you trust the most. Uh, and, the, and it can't be like a blood relation or a, um, you know, immediate obvious and, uh, and you get to define what trust means, 
right? So yes. and usually what the result is after you name them, then I have them, I, I, I extend the grid and I say now identify their, their race, their gender, their orientation, their age, are they married or not? Uh, you know, like all these common things that are more tightly tied to your values. And, and usually it's a very homogenous group. Like, like that's usually what the result is. It might be an outlier here or there, but we all do it. It's, it's, there's a, a, a tremendous source of comfort when you're around like-mindedness and people who share that. In the workplace, it's not often that that is A, possible to sustain. B, there's a lot of evidence that shows groups like that end up underperforming over time. So there's a lot of strong motivators to disrupt like-me bias when you're talking about being in the workplace. And that's a great segue to a question I was I, I wanted to ask you, which is really around ROI. Businesses and people get very busy and reducing bias is an incredibly important initiative for any organization and person that cares about these things I discussed in the intro, building culture, building great leaders, differentiating yourself, making better decisions, all these things you've just mentioned. But oftentimes it's it it literally is the path of least resistance to ignore it. So so organizations and people don't do anything about it. And so take a second to make the business case, Matthew, for the actual ROI around changing your culture to reduce bias. Well, uh, if it were only that simple, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> To, to, to isolate it to that one variable. But I, 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 if we go back to like me bias, and, and mind you, there are at least 200 named cognitive biases, right? Unconscious biases. With the advances in neuroscience and social psychology and evolutionary biology, all these different fields are studying how, the, how our brains are, are creating these different types of unconscious bias. I think it's really important to, you know, to name the type that we're, we're looking to see the impact in the workplace. Sure. So we can go back and use like me bias since we were talking about that a moment ago. And, and, and like me bias, I would argue if you have a small business and we're talking maybe 10 employees, 12 employees, maybe up to 100, wherever the line is, it's never an absolute. And at some point, when you're starting out, I think more often than not, having a high degree of, of, of like me bias actually would probably be more productive, right? When you're, when you're surrounding yourself with people who you know and like and trust, right? Who may all be very similar to you, you can wear a lot of different hats. You can do a lot of different things. You can perform the operations that are necessary for a small business to grow. Now, the question becomes, is that model sustainable and is it going to continue that same rate of growth? And the answer in most cases is no, it's not. Uh, you really have to begin diversifying at some point. Now, where that point is, there's not a hard and fast line that says here it is, but it is, right? And it's going to be. So do you need to start to, when do you need to start to disrupt that type of bias is the better question to ask if you're a small business owner that has surrounded himself with other or herself with just other like people uh, like themselves. That's so interesting to me because you've essentially normalized that this bias is taking place, but it's also a little bit of a provocative statement to say that if you're in a startup, it might be okay to have some of this like me bias going on for a period of time, it could actually benefit you. But what I also heard you say is that as you grow and evolve, there needs to be a great level of intentionality and proactivity in shifting that so that you end up with better outcomes, whether it's better decisions, better ability to hire and attract the top talent and et cetera, et cetera, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And the sooner it's done, usually the better. But it's a, you know, there's always competing priorities. There's always different demands. And usually diverse teams, 
uh, they, they may take a little bit longer to come to a decision, right? Because they're coming from different perspectives. And the fact is it just takes time to get through and come to that better decision but over time, it's been proven that it is indeed a better decision, right? So I think it's, it's, it's never a singular element. And I think that's what our brains, one of the biases of our, of our brains is we like binary constructs, right? We like on off, this, that, black, white. We like, you know, the, the singularity nature of that, because that gives us the kind of certainty that our brain craves just to create an opinion on something or to have a perception. Uh, and those, it gets right down to that level of neural wiring that we have to disrupt because those, those singular binary data points, definitions, uh, attributions, they over time, you know, become problematic. And wouldn't you say that if you do a good job with intentionally addressing bias as you grow and evolve? and you do become more diverse and you have alternate viewpoints and you make better decisions, the goal as your company's goal is to increase belonging, which really has a tie into engagement and hopefully employee experience, which now we're getting into the ROI, which we mentioned earlier, because the contrasting ROI on highly engaged workforce companies is significantly higher than on disengaged or companies that don't have high levels of belonging, right? I think it's in the 20 to 30% more profitable. Isn't that correct? Yes, yes, and more yes. I'm, I'm realizing this is an audio only as my head as I'm nodding the whole, everything that you're saying, I'm, I'm wholeheartedly agreeing with. You explained like me bias. What are the other types of bias? And I think you've identified, I remember seeing somewhere that you have a, you, you have like five core types of bias identified. Can you take us through those briefly? Absolutely. Um, it, it forms the acronym LEAP, which is another way that our brains like to process and record information. Uh, so L is like me bias, which is gravitating towards people who are like us. Uh, that is the unconscious bias. E is egocentric bias. The definition that I use is my views are clear and true to everyone. When we're operating from that mindset, this is very common with doctors, with lawyers, with uh, people who have a high degree of success in any one subject area or domain. Egocentric bias is almost inevitable uh, because like most unconscious biases, it serves you well until it doesn't. And I think with egocentric bias, the evidence that you're crossing the line and starting to <laughs> experience the negative effects of egocentric bias are when you are, you know, coming across as intimidating or you're not one, you, know, you, you, you step back and you wonder why aren't people, you know, doing what you want them to do. I said, I said it in the meeting, but you're not pausing to remember that people don't have that same level of expertise that you do, right? And even though you may have 30 years of in intense in-depth knowledge on molecular chemistry or accounting or whatever it may be, it still only represents what you know and not what's known in the universe, right? Like, like I think that's where we get, you know, we tend to get so myopic and wrapped up in our own selves that we, we, un, we, we forget that A, to be a good communicator, you have to get your, you have to make sure that people are understanding what you're saying. You're not talking in acronym ease that you are so familiar with, but nobody else is because they don't swim and live in your world, you know, day in and day out. That's egocentric bias. The others, I have two A's. So I'm going to spell LEAP intentionally, L-E-A-A-P. Availability bias, you touched on it earlier. It's just making decisions based on the most recent or available data. Examples of that is confirmation bias, right? We already have a preconceived idea. We just fill it with available information. Anchoring bias is really fascinating. Anchoring bias is the, the basis of the retail industry. It's the basis of the, the power of a first impression. It's our brain's tendency to get anchored on a, on a data point, a graph, or an image. And then everything else is anchored around that data point. So salespeople come in high, they have to come down a little bit, but it's anchored around that higher amount. 
Proximity bias is uh, an overvaluing of that which is closest to us by time and space. And when you think about how many relationships are formed, well, pre-COVID in the workplace, just based on who sat in the same area or who you passed or what's, you know, proximity bias is, is such a natural way of us overvaluing something that's closer to us when perhaps your best prospect might be somebody that's farthest away from you. It's often hard to maintain that same level of concentration, effort, energy, when somebody is, is farther away and by time and space. And so proximity bias is fascinating. I can go on and on about it because in COVID and in this virtual universe, proximity bias is dramatically different. And so, I, but it's also been very, very prominent in the thinking of people in the last two years. I brought up the example of the performance review in my intro. And of course, I run a company that's in the performance management space, but this is such an a common problem where in a review, there's not the co comprehensive picture of the entire year. So we may forget things that went really well or didn't go well earlier on. And so it can taint or bias or influence the overall review. Is that correct? And is that proximity bias? It is. And it's a, it's a natural phenomenon that can be easily mitigated. Proximity bias, you know, is very, very powerful, but of the five, it's also, I think, the easiest to mitigate uh, because you can mitigate against that error happening simply by getting rid of the annual part of the performance review and get into more iterative performance reviews that go on a, on a more frequent cadence. So frequency mitigates against proximity bias to remove the time uh, element. Glad to hear that because that's what we're, we try to do is have continuous performance management, which is really about ongoing documented performance feedback, praiseworthy and constructive feedback. Yes, yes. I might have an example for you of anchoring bias. So that one actually is fascinating to me. I love sailing and I've had the opportunity to do quite a few open ocean passages. And I am remembering a time when I was out at sea and I was on watch. So everybody's asleep. Uh, it's very quiet sailing along, uh, no moon and there's clouds. So it was a little bit dark, hard to see pretty much anything. So I'm navigating by radar and I see a blip on the radar and it's a very small blip in the distance. It appeared it wasn't moving. And as I got closer, I couldn't understand why this vessel wasn't moving and what it was. It was still pretty small. And then as I approached, all of a sudden it got larger and larger and larger on my radar screen. So now, now it looked like an enormous, it was like a, a cargo ship that my radar beam was only bouncing off of the front. And then as it turned, it all of a sudden filled my radar screen because it was bouncing off the entire side. And so bottom line, I was able to maneuver around this vessel, but had I not been paying attention, I could have potentially put myself and my crew in danger. And so I'm wondering, is this a type of anchor bias? Because I was literally honing in on that decision that is based on my first data point or the image that was on my radar? Absolutely. It's a great example. It's a great example. Too often, we just don't you know, we're all so busy. And in this case, you weren't busy, right? You were just, you were focused on that. But more often than not, anchoring bias comes in the form of advertisements, right? Like we get these powerful constructed images that get seared into our mind because they, if, if for no other reason, they're repeated over and over and over again through various devices, right? And that image, we get anchored on it. Right. So we don't, you know, we, 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 we cease to even question the, the validity or the credibility of it. And it's also that anchoring bias is the, is the, the fuel or the, the foundation of an effective brand. Right. Like, like how much money does Nike spend to have that swoosh mean something in our minds? And it's, it's due to anchoring bias.
let's talk about measurement for a minute because measuring growth in this area for any organization or person seems like it could be difficult, but also very important. You know, in business, they say, if you don't measure it, it doesn't get done. Right. So what are the ways that we can measure bias for ourselves and our organizations to make sure we're moving in the right direction? I'm so glad you asked that uh, because I'm finishing the second phase of, my, of, the, of a new program that I'm rolling out with uh, some of my clients. And it's the, it's the belonging piece of from bias to belonging. And coming up with an assessment to measure this, this very audacious and elusive idea of belonging, right? Like, what does that even mean for first, right? It's, 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 it's very audacious to say that in a workplace, you can satisfy this fundamental human need to belong somewhere. Like that is very bold. And so it, it's also very ethereal. And, and how do you measure it? Well, I, I've, I've come up with four elements of belonging. And one of them is the culmination. The starting point is the culmination of all the bias work, right? The bias work leads into ideas of how you identify in the workplace, which isn't a singular binary construct. You're not just a white male. Uh, you are also maybe a father. I think you shared that with me earlier. You're also, there's all these other layers and dimensions of your identity. So identity is one way that you can be measured in the workplace. Agency is another way that you can be measured in the workplace. How, how comfortable and confident are you, Jeff, in your role as the CEO of your business, right? And the other people, how confident are they to be able to challenge authority in some cases, if needed, right? How comfortable are they with their skills and abilities in the, you know, in the responsibilities that they have? The other is power, right? Power is often overlooked and unaddressed. And yet it drives so much of the dynamics of any given meeting, right? Just your presence can change the course of the conversation. And yet it's never really, I don't think, thought through explicitly. More often than not, it's just taken for granted. And the final one is flow. What, what, you know, that, that's the, there was a, a very relatively famous psychologist, Michaela Csikszentmihalyi, that defined this and coined this term flow, which is that state of being where you are just in it. And athletes get it when they're in the zone, uh, but, but accountants can get it. You can get it. I can, we, we all have had it. We've all experienced it, but that's the final measure for, you know, the, the cultural elements, which I think can be very, abstract and elusive. And so this is, a, this is a framework that gets placed into the organization so that it gives you ways to measure how, how, how your intentional architecting of your culture is being received by your employees. I love that. And I think it sounds like it's going to give organizations the ability to really also understand what's most important, which often is a challenge for organizations and individuals, especially as they try to align their workforce around these areas. So I really appreciate uh, what you're doing there. A couple more questions, and I'm going to shift us to some lightning round questions. But I'd, li I'd like to know about the relationship between curiosity and bias and defensiveness and bias, if there is a correlation. So can you speak to those two things? Yeah, that goes back to what we mentioned earlier on in this, uh, in this conversation around the language that's being used. You know, there are ways to hold these kinds of sensitive conversations. And part of the way that you do this is to set some agreements up front. Right, and not just assume that everybody's coming into this conversation at the same level, at the same place of understanding, but really level setting before you begin and making sure that you're talking the same language, that it's not, you know, that you're defining it. And if you, if you approach this 
with a curious mind, then it just becomes exciting. The, the accompanying feeling that drives the rest of the conversation is excitement. Hmm. Without those emotional check-ins, what happens is the emotions then just drive the rest of the reactions to the conversation. I see. And uh, we like to think that we're very logical, rational creatures, but uh, we're not. <laughs> a lot of, most of the recent uh, research around neuroscience is showing that this, this area of unconscious mental processing it's already put your conscious mind into the car and has you driving down the road before you even realize like you've, you've put the key in the ignition, if that makes any sense. It does make sense. You can't fight it. You have to really back up, level set before you can actually get and get to the destination that you want to be. It's amazing how it permeates every aspect of our being as well. As much as we wouldn't like the emotion to influence and take over. It does. And I'm even thinking of the merger and acquisition space. I have some experience in that. And people will try to remove the emotion from those decisions, but it's virtually impossible. Because if you're selling your company and you've invested and put your, <laughs> your blood, sweat, and tears into it, you're going to probably think it's worth more than it actually is. And it's going to be a difficult thing. If you're acquiring the company, it's, it's the same thing. So on the other side, but wouldn't you say that's true? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and a, a much more effective strategy is to acknowledge and try to accurately, accurately pinpoint what the emotion is, as opposed to just trying to deny it and allowing it to continue shaping the rest of your decision. A, a common example of this is how quick our brains are to find fault in whatever we didn't decide. Right, like when people move from the you know from the city to a suburb, or or you know they relocate, or they take a new job, or you know the, our tendency is to only focus on the reasons for something, right? The the rationale for something, which is why I, I love the phrase that we're not rational creatures; we're rationalizing creatures. We're really good at rationalizing our preconceived ideas. All right, let's shift to some lightning round questions. My first one for you is, what are you most grateful for, Matthew? Uh, my kids. I won't even hesitate on that. My kids and my wife. Oh, my gosh, my family. So yeah. definitely uh, grateful for them. But, you know, health, uh, I, I've, uh, I've also, I think, as, as most uh, who, are, who are still surviving a global pandemic, uh, we can no longer take health for granted. And that includes mental health. I think that's also, you know, a trend that's rising is, is people having illnesses and, and, uh, and mental health related problems. But the inverse of that is the, the problems can be addressed earlier as opposed to letting them escalate and fester and become truly problematic. No question. Health and family. What is the most difficult leadership lesson you've learned over your career? Even my best thinking may be implicitly flawed at some level. You are drinking your own Kool-Aid there, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> I like that you said I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid too. I'm not uh, eating my own dog food. I never liked that. Oh yeah, thing. exactly. Kool-Aid's much better than dog food. <laughs> I like champagne actually. I'm, I'm drinking True. my own champagne is what I <laughs> All right. Who's one person you would interview if you could, living or not? Oh, wow. Uh, Nelson Mandela jumps to mind. Uh, Mother Teresa. Love to sit down with Mother Teresa. What is, do you have any book recommendations or what's your top book recommendation? Behave by Robert Sapolsky. Uh, it's a book that very dense, but I love it because it really unpacks the levels of complexity inside of human behavior. Uh, he takes a very biological approach and uh, blows up this so many preconceived ideas uh, that, that uh, many of us like to hang our hats on um, about what it means to be human. 
And uh, it's, it's just, you can look at his TED talk. It's like a, you know, 14 minute TED talk. And, it, and if that intrigues you, then get the book because the book just takes it and uh, really unpacks those ideas that he presents in his, uh, in his TED talk. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Don't give it. The wise don't need it and the ignorant won't heed it. So don't give advice. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so Matthew, if you had to synthesize the talk, what's the what would you say is one of the most important takeaways to leave our listeners with today? Oh, that's such a layup. If you have a brain, you have bias. Don't be afraid of the biases that are inside of your brain because they're already controlling most of what you do. So uh, explore them, get to know them. You'll discover more about who you are and how you do what you do. And uh, you can move from that space to a greater sense of belonging in the world. And where can people find you? The Percipio Company, all one word, dot com. P-E-R-C-I-P-I-O company dot com. Matthew, thank you for expanding our horizons and perspectives today. I really appreciated our conversation. Same here, Jeff. It's been great. Thanks for listening to the show this week. We release new episodes every other Tuesday. Let me know what you thought of this episode by emailing humancapital at goalspan.com. Human Capital is produced by Goalspan. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And please share this podcast with your colleagues, team, or friends. Thanks for being human. Kind.